Hello everyone, welcome to the eighth lecture on reinforcement learning. Today we're going to be studying policy gradient methods. So if you remember last week we looked at value function approximation. So we looked at using function approximators like deep neural network or linear functions to approximate the value function or the action value function. And today we're also going to be using function approximators but we're going to be trying to learn to characterize the behavior of an agent. So the policy of an agent or some distribution over the actions it takes conditional on being in some state. So it, it can be like a lazy agent or uh, a hardworking agent and we're going to try and parameterize how it should behave or whether it should be lazy or whether it should be hardworking and what is the, the best policy to do. So in this lecture I'll introduce policy based methods and we'll discuss their various characteristics. In particular, we'll look at their advantages and how they can give better convergence guarantees and work in continuous action spaces, like, for example, con controlling a robot. And uh, we'll examine how they can learn stochastic policies, which are especially advantageous when using value function approximators, or in particular, in partially observable environments where you can't quite see the entire state space. You can't see the whole environment available to you. Again, like if you're driving around in a car, you can't see all of the contents inside the building, so you've got this partially observable environment. And so these kind of approaches work particularly well in that case. And, and then we're going to look at the definition of, say, just policy gradient estimators, um, how we go about optimizing the parameters of a policy function. And this will lead us nicely into the reinforce algorithm, which is quite an old algorithm, but it's useful to lay a foundation down. <laughs> um, we'll be spending the last third of the lecture on more recent methods, uh, specifically on actor critic methods. And these are where you have two neural networks. One is the actor, which chooses the actions that you take. And the other is this kind of critic, which criticizes uh, the action value function. And it tells you if it's a uh, good or a bad action that's been taken. And finally, we're going to consider some of some kind of extensions where I'll outline some recommended further reading that builds on this. So this will be like a foundation where you haven't got the tools available to go and read the state of the art papers uh, and, and go ahead and implement more advanced techniques. And these are going to be particularly relevant for uh, scaling these methods up and doing more complex environments like you get in the assignment. Okay, so in the last lecture we considered two types of value function approximation. We parameterize the function by some weights vector. Uh, so uh, we, we had this approximate, approximation of the weights vector where we considered the state value function, which, which tells us how much reward we get from some MDP um, in expectation if we follow some policy, this, this pi. So if we're in a state, the function tries to estimate the expected value of the reward we'll get from that point onwards under, under that policy. Then we discuss the, the action value, um, the quarter if you like, the Q function. And this tells us the true accumulated expected reward we can get from being in that state uh, and taking some action A again under, under that policy pi. And what we did was instead of storing like a massive table uh, or this big table for all of the action values, uh, we used a function approximator like a deep neural network parameterized by the weights vector W to approximate all of those values. So the inputs to the neural network were the state and the action being considered, uh, the state and the action being considered, and it would basically try to estimate the value of being in that state. And that's, that's not always the best idea, like if you're in a complicated environment, to try and work out the whole value that you would get from all of those future actions can actually be quite a difficult thing to do. Um, but nevertheless, we, we treated this like it was a supervised learning problem where we started off trying to estimate the value function and we took a max over all the actions and used that as our grand truth. And if you remember, we saw that this had some kind of convergence issues, which we somewhat addressed by aggregating all of those experiences that you receive when you play the game into, into like that replay buffer. And that helped create like a, a kind of mini data set, if you like. Um, that was less susceptible to the episodic correlations and issues of it being non-IID. Uh, so it helped, but it, but it, um, but it still had a, a few issues with it, but it, it does greatly stabilize it using those kind of uh, replay buffers. And we also looked at more advanced strategies like important sampling where we weight the experiences we receive. So we don't just uniformly sample from that data set. Okay, so 
what has been the policy itself as we've been you know if we go back through all of the past lectures what has actually been the policy we've been learning so far well with all the techniques we've been considering we didn't really have a notation uh, of a policy function maybe at the very beginning we briefly touched on it but in other words the policy hasn't really been explicitly represented before and we've just said that we optimize the policy by taking some max over our um, action value functions so we find the action that has the that maximizes the reward and we say that that one there uh, is our policy so we just acted greedily or epsilon greedily as our strategy to find the best policy but now what we're going to do is we're going to have a different approach where we're going to have a different function approximator that parameterizes the distribution of actions conditional of being in some state. So we say that the parameters are represented by some vector theta. In this case, so last, last week we had w as our, our parameters, and this week we're going to be looking at theta. Um, and we're going to change the parameters. But, but if just imagine changing those parameters, that's actually going to affect the distribution over which actions we take. Uh, or which actions are chosen. So instead of choosing the maximum action, we're going to be sampling from a distribution of actions. So if we look at this equation down here, um, we say pi here is the probability that the action A, um, given the environment, is in the state S, So, and it's parameterized by theta. So you could also note, notate this with subscripts on the variables, e.g. to say this occurs at some time step t, you could say action t or state at some time step t. Um, but basically, that's what it is. This is the distribution over the actions conditional of being in some state. And I hope that's kind of clear. Um, today, we're going to be looking at how we can optimize within this kind of framework. Um, and it is worth mentioning that this all kind of deviates quite a bit from what we've been studying so far. So everything up to this point has been layering methods on top of the foundations. But today, we're kind of going to go off in a bit of a tangent. Basically, this gives us a distribution of actions that we can sample from. So um, instead of taking that maximum, we, we can sample from this probability distribution. <clears throat> and uh, remember, the p here is kind of like this is a probability mass function or a discrete distribution, but it could also be like a lower case p for a continuous distribution. So we can actually learn uh, to sample from continuous action spaces. All right, so why might we do this? Well. Sometimes it's more efficient to represent the policy than it is to represent the value function. So consider, for example, like one of those Atari games, or let's just think specifically about the coursework for Gravatar. Um, consider the value function. It might be very difficult to work out what is the expected value is from some point onwards based on how much you rotate your ship. So it's like, if I rotate my ship to the right, what is, if I play optimally throughout the entire game, what is the most score I could get? having that as your value function. And that's like really, really hard because um, it's like playing the game Tetris. It's really very difficult to work out like what your score is gonna be, but given that you can move left or right, you might know that, it's, that you can improve your score slightly or do better, or it's, it's not good to let the ball fall down, but it's very hard to work out the, the, the total reward you'll get going off into the future. So um, if, if we go back to Gravatar, you know, if you've got a wall in front of you and you're about to crash, it, it may be quite a simple, that might be a simple policy which just says turn around and move away from the wall. You know, that's quite a simple thing to parameterize. And that's much easier than working out that you're going to get a value of, say, 532 points if you hit the wall versus 619 points if you don't hit the wall. So similarly, if you remember back to the last lecture, we had all of those issues of convergence with DQNs, DQ networks. And we needed to start doing several tricks to make it all much more stable. And do you remember we had those cases where it would have been, you have those catastrophic divergences going to occur and you get those chattering around the value function. So we started to add like batch learning strategies with experience replay. Well, in, con in contrast, if you follow the gradient of your policy, uh, you tend to smoothen out the policy, which leads to increased stability. In particular, you don't kind of tend to see those catastrophic divergences that you get, and you tend to always find at least a local optima. So this all becomes much more like classical deep learning, where you've got some kind of bias variance trade-off based on the parameterization and the regularization. And policy-based methods also tend to be quite effective in high-dimensional or continuous action spaces. 
So remember with the value-based methods or the action value-based methods, you need to act greedily over your actions. So you need to compute <coughs> like that max over the set of actions. Well, while that's been quite easy, what happens if you say had trillions of possible actions available or even like an infinite space of actions, like an infinite number of actions? For example, if you're controlling the robot, robotic arm in this uh, figure here, then you know you might be able to change the voltages of the signals in the actual actuators, and this voltage might be an action represented as a real number. So you could ha you can have an infinite number of voltages to to move and expand the fingers out. So it's not like you just choose to move one of the fingers discreetly. So how are you going to do a max over that? Like you've got like millions of possible voltages you can put into all of the different actuators to work out. How are you going to just take some max to find out what the optimal voltage is? Well, you could consider like discretizing your space into some very, very large large number of possible discrete uh, settings, but that's still going to be super inefficient. And there are cases or environments where you just can't easily do it. You can't take that max. That, that max becomes intractable. So instead, you, you can use this policy-based method where you adjust all your parameters to learn your policy directly. So where, where you start to learn what the max likelihood might be rather than just having to explicitly compute that max. And this leads us really nicely onto the fourth reason why policy gradient methods are advantageous, um, which is that they can be used to learn stochastic policies as opposed to deterministic policies. And we'll see why this is very important in the next slide. But it's also mentioned there are some disadvantages to this. It's not just like a win-win. Um, so naive policy-based learning can actually be a bit slow and it can have higher variances than value-based learning. So if you think of value-based methods, um, that max, if you like, is very aggressive and always moves directly to the mode of the distribution. And it, it, it tends to find a global optimum when you, when you take that max, which is it's really good in theory. Um, but in practice, remember that in deep learning, we often want to find like a good local minimum that generalizes well. Well, policy-based learning tends to find a good local minima rather than like the global optima, which means that it, it can often get stuck doing quite sensible things, but it may not find rare cases of optimal behavior. So if, if, if you're like stuck in this maze um, and like most of the paths lead forward and you know your goal's in that direction, so on the expected case, it would be sensible to move towards the goal, but it might be that there's this rare strategy to go backwards in the wrong direction into this really small obscure door which goes on this really really long complicated tangent but that actually ends up being faster than go taking an immediately obvious uh, path to take. So they tend to get stuck doing these sensible things and you may, might in rare cases um, not find this optimal behavior that you might find otherwise if you were to take the max. So this is all because policy-based methods learn a distribution over the actions uh, e.g. a softmax function, so it's a lot smoother in practice. And to learn this distribution, um, you know, it can, it can require multiple gradient steps in the direction of that distribution, which makes them a, a lot more stable, but sometimes a little bit less parameter efficient. Okay, so this is an example that I like from David Sil Silver, um, which helps explain why stochastic policies are particularly important with function approximators. So looking at the top left here, Imagine we have some small grid world like you've seen before. And just like before, you know, it's like this frisbee game where if you fall into the melted water, you terminate uh, and you lose. But if you manage to move around to find where the frisbee is, then that's the, you get some reward and that's a good thing. To, that's the correct state to find. But try to imagine this uh, as being like some infinitely large grid world where you've got some infinite number of states. Like it could be this kind of continuous action space sorry, this continuous state space, like in the real world, where we can move in many, many, many different positions. So instead, we're going to try to not have like every state represented in some table. So just try to imagine these states are uh, estimated by some neural network. So the neural network looks at the state locally, and it tries to represent it by some feature representation. So we're going to say there's some network out there which takes as input some local conditions of the state and it, and it estimates the feature that it's in. Oh, and this network has just learnt to distinguish like which walls are around the state. So the features you might just say like having a wall on the left, above, 
to the right, and so on. And there, there are feature factors. So specifically, we're going to say the, the far left wall here is distinguishable as it's got this wall to the left, and the far right state here is distinguishable as it's got a, a wall to the right. And then the middle state here, we can say it's distinguishable um, as it's got no walls to the bottom here. You know, you can walk from here into this state here. Um, but then the other two states here, or this state here and this state here, um, they're indistinguishable from each other, or locally they look the same as each other because they've both got walls on the top and the bottom, but they don't have walls on the left and the right because you can move between the states. So, so these two states, according to our neural network, look identical to each other um, within this feature representation that the neural network's learned. So if we were to actually follow a deterministic policy function, which chooses the actions simply based on the input features, uh, and we, we then choose a max over action based on it, then we'll get the same value shared across both feature representations for, this, for these two states, because they locally look identical to each other. So this means that a deterministic policy function will have to choose the same action in both of those states, which means if you were to act greedily with respect to this value function, or the action value function, it means you're either going to have to go left all of the time or you're going to have to go right all of the time. Uh, and in this case, we're just showing that you have to go left as shown here. And that means you're going to get stuck in some local minima and it's never going to converge no matter how many iterations you do. So if you're in this state here, um, you're always going to go back backwards and you're never going to be able to get out of this, this local minima here. Doesn't matter how much you, how many times you iterate that. But if we you use this learn to stochastic policy. So if we if we learn to sample from um, this policy here, yeah, as we learn some distribution over our actions, this means that we can encounter a, a feature representation which is shared across many states. We can actually capture the value of that feature representation as a distribution over which actions should be taken. So in this case there's walls above and there's walls below, um, but there's no walls to the sides, just like in these two states. Um, we can basically learn to move either left or right with equal probability. And therefore, when we explore around, we're not going to get stuck in that local minima uh, in this far left state, because it will have some equal probability of, of uh, going right or left. So some of the time it will come out of this state and, and move correctly down. And similarly here, some of the time it will, some of the time it will go back again, but some of the time it will um, move out of this state in the correct direction and come back down again. So that's much better because it means we don't get stuck into these local minima and we will eventually find those nice high reward situations, even, even though the states locally uh, look the same according to our feature representation. So you may be a little bit confused at this point. Uh, and remember something we said early on, which was that there's always a deterministic optimal policy when you have an MDP. But you've got to remember that was for a complete Markov decision process or a complete MDP where we stored the value function in this large table and we have this perfect state representation. But what we have is, a part, is often have is partial observability where the features you want from your function approximate to limit the view of the world or they limit what you can experience, see visually. Um, and then it can be optimal to use a stochastic policy in these cases. So you can imagine a state in a game where it looks the same as some other state, but actually you're in just based on your experiences, you're actually in very different pictures of reward. So especially if you can't see your score, um, you can be in some room uh, and this nightmarish monster might appear, but the room looks the same as a, another room, which is a very safe room where there's a, a massive treasure box just next to it. Okay, so basically in these kind of cases, policy-based methods can be much better than value-based methods uh, like we've been doing previously. Okay, so we've said we're going to use a function approximator to estimate the policy. And we could actually use any kind of optimization approach for finding the parameters of this. So if you've done the AI search module, you've seen how you can optimize functions using things like hill climbing or genetic algorithms. But what we really want to do is we want to use gradient-based optimization strategies. So with gradient-based approaches, we can parameterize our policy function using, say, a very, very large deep neural network, and we can then take advantage of very efficient gradient updates. So we need to somehow come up with some estimate of the gradient. Um, and to do this, we need to typically do some kind of empirical averaging 
for example, over a batch of our uh, samples. So this is why we, we have this kind of uh, expectation here, so we can do this empirical averaging. And if you just take a glance at this equation right now, um, you, the first thing that might jump out to you is, is this log here, and you might be asking, well, why is there a log here? And remember, this is a distribution over actions. This is a probability distribution over all of our potential actions. So the hopefully the equation that's jumping out to you, that how do we optimize the distribution? Well, we want to maximize the likelihood um, of that distribution over the observations. So we want the max likelihood equations. And you might be able to see this how that falls into the picture of the max likelihood equations. So, but but try to think of this distribution as um, something we can have, as like a we can choose a, a distribution which fits the kind of uh, environment we're trying to do reinforcement learning on. So if you've got a discrete action space like in Gravatar, where you've got um, a set of actions you can take, then we would want to have a categorical distribution, so like a one-hot encoding where. Uh, the probability is one at the action we wish to take. And to, to capture that, you might want to use like a softmax function. Um, if, you, if you recall from the energy-based learning, the energy models lecture, a softmax is uh, just where you take your output of your neural network, uh, you feed it into a softmax function, and that ensures that the output, no matter what it is, always integrates to one, and that it's non-negative, non and it uses some exponentials in the um, numerator and the denominator to push the highest value towards one and all of the other values it pushes towards zero. Or the most likely value it pushes to, towards one and all the others it pushes towards zero. But you can also use like a Gaussian distribution. So if you've got a continuous action space, you might want to learn a Gaussian um, over the, the, the values of the action that you want. <clears throat> uh, but again, we need the gradient of this distribution. So we want the gradient of this function with respect to the, to the parameters, so we can then optimize the parameters to maximize the likelihood. And if you remember the generative models lecture, where we introduced the max likelihood equation, um, if you remember the actual definition of the max likelihood equation, it had that big product in there. And then we could take the log of both sides and turn that product into an expectation, um, which doesn't change the argmax of it, which is basically what we've done here, which is where the logs come, come from. <laughs> OK, so. The last part of the equation here is particularly important. Um, this is like maybe something new to, to what you're seeing. Um, so it's basically weighting the probabilities by this whatever this value is, because we're multiplying the probabilities of this distribution by by whatever this thing is. So this is this is really how we weight the distribution. And this a hat here is called the advantage function, um, and it's just kind of like a more general form of the action value function with some nice characteristics. So the advantage by its definition is simply the difference between, uh, so yes, yeah, it's, it's simply the difference between the return values and the actual values. So it's basically the same as the action value function, but instead of telling us the value, it tells us the advantage to be gained. So because of that expectation, you can calculate it just by subtracting the value function from Q. And you can alternatively just replace that directly with the action value function. So you could just replace that with Q, but this is just a little bit nicer um, to do this, but it, but it would work to, to replace it with Q. So um, the, di the difference here is that using the advantage function is A equals the Q value sub minus the value function. Basically it has lower variance by taking the state action value off from the, bottom, off from the baseline. So we compute the returns by summing up our discounted rewards into the future, and then we sub subtract that um, by our current estimate of the value function from our model. All right, so conceptually, what is this doing? And it's saying, I'll say it kind of slowly, um, we define the gradient of our policy network such as to maximize the likelihood of the actions that give the most advantage. So that, that's really what this whole the whole equation is saying. So the, um, I'll say that again, we define the policy, we, sorry, we define the gradient of our policy network such as to maximize the likelihood of the actions or over the actions uh, in such a way that gives us the most advantage. All right, so let's um, pull this all together now, uh, put it all together and, and kind of just naively implement it and see what happens.
<clears throat> so for now, I want you to kind of just forget everything you've done with dynamic programming and Monte Carlo methods and TD learning, and just forget like everything you've done with function approximators. We'll introduce this kind of stuff a little bit back again later. But we're just going to really naively implement a policy gradient based method by actually naively just manually computing the return. And we get this algorithm here. So we're going to start by just initializing um, our parameters theta, you know, initializing a random policy network with some random parameters. And we'll start by just sampling a, um, a complete episode. Uh, here and, and remember this is like a Monte Carlo method, so it requires complete episodes all the way into the future complete tra trajectories And then what we're going to do is we're going to just uh, compute the return by summing uh, all the discounted values by this discounted value function uh, values of the reward going into the uh, of that episode um, And then we need to go once we've done that once we've got this uh, return here. We're going to go back through all of the uh, states and we're going to update all our parameters theta by moving um, them just a little bit in the uh, direction of the gradient that maximizes the log probabilities multiplied by um, the return here that we got from that point onwards. So if I just open this code here. Okay. So here's, here's some code from the reinforce. Uh, algorithm. So at the top, we have our policy network here. Um, this is pi, if you like, in, in that code. And this uh, receives input states. So it re receives input states and <coughs> outputs the action probabilities. Okay. And it does like a, a, a softmax um, over the actions here, which turns that into a um, it turns it into a distribution uh, and it makes it integrate to one by some exponential factor. <clears throat> and then in this select action function uh, just here, oops, sorry, in this select action function, we sample episodes. Um, we, we start, we basically select a actions by sampling from a categorical distribution. And uh, that's what this code here does. Um, so it samples from that, like, so that softmax distribution samples an action from it. Um, and al alternatively, you could in PyTorch define this as a categorical distribution. Um, you'd have to not use the softmax here and do things a little bit differently, but you could use a, a Gaussian here, for example. Then if we go down to the main code at the bottom here, um, we basically start by sampling a complete episode. So this, this whole code just basically keeps sampling um, states, actions, and rewards until we're done, and we aggregate or we push all of those, push all of that in, and then it calls this finish, finish episode function. So we've, at this point in time, we've got this complete episode in memory, uh, all in here, and we basically accumulate our rewards at each state, and then uh, when we sample the complete episode, we compute the return by this discounted faction factor here. So we compute the return. Um, going through, and then at the end here we, we compute the loss, and uh, which is the log probabilities times the return, and then we back propagate, updating all the parameters such as to minimize this policy gradient <laughs> or this policy gradient loss here. Okay, and that's where we multiply the probabilities through by the reward. So in this reinforce approach is. Um, really quite old now. It's, it's an old policy gradient approach from 1988. And I wouldn't really recommend it. Uh, it's not particularly scalable and it requires this traditional approach for estimating the value function. But it's still, it's a, it's a nice idea to just see how it can be done sort of standalone uh, and, it, and it works in its own way. So just a brief recap of what's happened so far. Uh, we've estimated the gradient of the return by taking a sample of our episode but this gives like very high variance. For example, if you're playing Atari like Gravatar, um, it might be good that you get like a good score sometimes, but 90% of the time you're gonna get no score at all. And maybe if you started running the course, but you're seeing this a lot. So you see that 
most of the time you just get zero, 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 but occasionally you get like quite a high score. So you've got this high, high variance going on. And that just comes from the randomness of what happens. And maybe most of the time your ship just gets dragged into the killing star at the beginning of the game. So you get this very noisy play. Now, the, the main idea of actor critic methods is that instead of using the return to estimate the action value function, we're going to instead use a critic function as an approximator for that estimate. So we're going to bring back the ideas from last lecture, and we're going to combine the action value function approximation with these new policy methods. So like last week, we'll have our true action value function, which we're going to estimate using a, like, a function approximator, but then we're going to use that just as like a component for our policy gradient approach as a substitute for QPI. And this means that we have now two models with two sets of parameters, which is why they're called actor critic. So you have this critic, which judges the actions, like the example here where we have an actor which chooses an action. So this, this actor here, they're playing this game with Tetris and it chooses the action. It tries to say, is it good for me to rotate this piece? As one of its actions, it could press left or right on the keypad to rotate the piece in a different way. And the actor thinks it's, it's a good, good idea to rotate the, the piece. But then the critic says, no, that's a terrible idea to do that. And the critic says, rotating that piece is a really bad idea. So in other words, the actor is responsible for taking actions or acting, uh, and it makes all the decisions. And the critic is just there to, as a sort of spectator, which watches the actor and what it's doing and evaluates whether it thinks that's a good or bad thing. They kind of bootstrap from each other. OK, so putting this all together, we're going to combine the actor and the critique into a more formal definition of the actor critique approach and the algorithm here. So we're going to use an approximate policy gradient to adjust the actor policy in the direction that maximizes the reward according to some critique function. So if we look at the equation down here, uh, we see that the critique, or Q with the, with the parameters W, just estimates the action value function, uh, given some state in action repair, it estimates the value function, which tells us basically um, how good the reward is or the direction of the reward is at. And then this, this other bit here is just the same as before. So if you remember, we could also have the advantage here, so we could have an estimate of the advantage, which would be equally valid. Um, but basically we just update the parameters a little bit in the direction of the gradient that maximize the likelihood times the advantage or times the, um, in this case, we have this, this, this Q network here, this approximator here parameterized by W. And this policy network is parameterized by theta. So this is just like wrapping it all together now. Um, so the critique, this QW here says, I think this action is good in this state, or it says, I, I think this, is, this action is a bad idea to, to take in this state. So we're going to update our parameters theta a little bit in the direction of the things that the critique says are good. All right, so let's just go through this algorithm now. So we start by just uh, initializing our state, and we randomly initialize our deep neural network parameters uh, and the weights, also the parameters of the um, critique. And then we, what we do is we sample an action from our policy. Uh, so from the actor network, I should say. So this, this is sampling from the actor, conditional on being in this state here. It tells us how good it is to take that action. And initially, that's what we see, just random. So it's almost like a random action. Um, and then the actor network does a softmax function over its output neurons, which gives a set of probabilities which we can actually sample from, that categorical that we see in PyTorch. Then for t time steps here, um, we sample the reward at the next state from the environment, uh, conditional on taking that state, conditional on taking that action uh, at, at our current state here. And if you're playing Atari, this just basically takes you to the next state S prime uh, when you take an action. For example, if you press the fire button on your controller, um, <coughs> you know, it tells you the reward you're going to get at time step RT, uh, the reward you get at R, R subscript T. And with that information, you can then sample your next action from the uh, actor again. 
and you basically feed the actor network with the new state that you're in uh, and um, that gives you the distribution over the next actions that, you, that you're in and that's how you do that kind of look ahead. Okay and, and now what you do is you update your actor as per the equation so basically you optimize the actor network parameters in the direction that maximizes the reward from the critique here. And this is just basically the same as that, although these things are swapped. <clears throat> right. And after we've done that, we update the critique in the same way as the last lecture, but using TD learning. So we, we compute the TD error, which was the immediate reward um, plus the discounted value of being in the next state. <laughs> Okay, the, or the discounted value of the next reward um, minus the current reward, which is basically our, our Bauman equation. And now we can use that to update the critique network weights w, just like in the last lecture, to estimate this action value function. So we update w a little bit in the uh, direction of this gradient. And note there's like this, this learning rate alpha here. Um, there's, there's two alphas here. Actually, it's quite common to have different alphas for the actor updates and for the critique updates here. So you can have like alpha subscript one and alpha subscript two, but I haven't really shown it in this, this algorithm here. Um, but it's quite good to just tune those different learning rate parameters between the different actor and critique networks separately. So lastly, we can basically update our state and action to the next state and the next action. So we're set up again correctly for the next iteration. So with that all in place, let's just uh, have a look at some code to do this. Okay, so this is all just the standard thing again, but this time we have two networks. We have our actor network and our critique network, um, and both of them receive states, just the number of states as inputs. Um, so this is basically your observation of your environment. So it could be like your memory in Gravatar, or it could be like pixel values on a screen. And um, the actor chooses like an action, so it has the number of outputs. So this is the number of actions we can take as our outputs. And we do a softmax over those um, <coughs> to turn them into distribution. Whereas the critique is just like a judge, which says how good it is to take a particular action or not. So it's just got a single output neuron, which corresponds to how well it does. All right, now in the forward pass here, you see that both networks take as input the state. So you take this input state x and you pass that into both networks. Um, but then the output distribution here, we wrap in some categorical, which allows us to then later sample from it. This is a really nice helper function you get in PyTorch, which lets you sample from the underlying distribution. So it's quite nice to use. So you can change this to like Gaussian and sample from a Gaussian as well if you want a continuous action space. So also the value of the critique is, is returned as well as the distribution function, which contains the actual probabilities themselves alongside that ability to, that wrap, wrapper to sample from it, sample new actions from it. Okay, um, and this code implements an extension, sorry, an extension of actor critique, which is the advantage actor critique, which we covered in the very first equation. So instead of the Q values, it, it uses the advantage. Um, so if I just scroll down a bit. So yeah, this is the advantage actor critique. Um, so instead of just the Q values, it, it does the actual advantage definition like we saw in the first equation. So it's the returns minus the values. Instead of just the TD error here, we train on the advantages. <coughs> okay. Um, but basically, the algorithm is otherwise really similar, which is that we start by um, where is it? Just trying to find it. Yeah, we start by just this this dot sample because remember the model returns the wrapper around the distribution, so we can sample our actions from the actual underlying action distribution, and then we want to sample the next state and the reward from the environment under that uh, action. Okay, so this gives us the next state and the reward uh, for taking that action within the environment, um, and then we take the log of the action probability to work out how likely that was. Okay, and there's like a slight addition here which you can read about in the A3C paper, which is that they add some kind of entropy regularizer, 
Um, but this is basically this is something you read about in the paper and it encourages a little bit of extra exploration. So according to their paper, the entropy loss encourages more of a uniform sampling rather than just letting any one particular action dominate all the time. So that's just some nice little contribution of their paper. But lastly, at the bottom, you get the final loss um, down here, <coughs> um, which for the actor is just the log probability multiplied by the advantages we've seen. So it tries to maximize the likelihood of the actions that the critic thinks gives that the high value. And note there's like a detach here, as we don't really want to back propagate through the critique for this loss. But then we have the critique loss, which is simply the L2 norm of the advantage. So it tries to make the value function estimate the, um, it, it tries to make it match the return, I should say. All right, so that's, that's kind of how that all comes together now. And I think that's really the foundations put down now. So in practice, there is quite a lot of extensions to this. So I strongly recommend you spend like at least a couple of hours reading recent papers that build on these ideas. And in the top link here, uh, there's a nice set of papers in PyTorch implementations. So we'll just open that now here. Um, and these really introduce quite a lot, a lot more tricks available to you. So I'd recommend just scanning through the code at the top here. So click through each of these and having a scan through. Um, and you, alongside the code here, you also have the papers. Uh, and again, you can go into like one of those papers and just have a quick look through pick up the concepts that you're familiar with now with this foundational actor critique knowledge down and just see how they extend the basic basic idea and what their contributions are. The second link here um, links to Lillian Wang's blog. And this is a really um, nice little state of the art report, or we call it a star. Um, and it just kind of goes through very densely uh, the kind of notation and theory um, behind some of these techniques. So they she just very quickly introduces very mathematically dense theory of reinforce, uh, actor critique methods, the kind of similar algorithms that we've seen today, um, and goes through quickly into more state-of-the-art art techniques. And there's just hundreds of these available. Um, and this covers quite comprehensively, but it's, it's hard read. I recommend, rather than just trying to get everything from this blog post, actually opening up some of the papers, maybe YouTubing and seeing other people explain the concepts as part of learning. But do, um, yeah, do like look at the results in the papers because a lot of the papers can be very, very mathematical and long and extensive. And then you look at the results for something like Atari and it turns out that it's worse than just the naive baseline algorithm. This, this kind of stuff really is, I would say, almost first year PhD level. Um, so it's quite advanced, but it, it is worth having a glance through to see if anything's relevant. <clears throat> we'll see if anything's useful. Um, so don't be put off by this blog here. I would, I would recommend starting with these kind of, maybe maybe looking at some of the extensions here as a good place to start if you're, if you're wanting to pursue these kinds of methods. So in addition to this, I've picked out the following, um, sorry. Uh, I've picked out here to make your life a bit easier for papers, um, which I would recommend studying these in a little bit more detail. So rather than just being overwhelmed by, say, uh, Lillian Wang's blog, um, you might just want to study these for in a bit more detail. And when you study these papers, I recommend the Feynman technique for learning, which is basically um, where you, if there's, if there's something complex or difficult or, or a word or a terminology or a piece of mathematical notation that you find really challenging, just write down whatever that is on a piece of paper then go into Wikipedia, go onto YouTube and listen to people explain whatever that thing that you're stuck about is. Maybe it's some advanced piece of mathematics. And then um, if in the process of trying to explain it like you were to say a child or someone, you can't do that or there's another piece of mathematics you don't understand in Wikipedia relating to that concept, then just create a new piece of paper with that new piece of mathematics, put it on the top and try and explain that concept to a child. And basically that, that process creates a hierarchy of the gaps in your knowledge, which is very good for good technique for learning advanced mathematics. So I'd recommend the Feynman technique and just reading some of these papers here. Um, so just, oops, sorry. This first paper here, 
um, is basically what we've just looked at in the code. Um, it's just that advantage actor critique extension. So you, you should already have some exposure to that. But the second one here just shows that you can also add experience replay to active crit critic methods, as we saw in the DQN lecture last week. And this gives a further increase to stability um, and can also be used to increase the sample efficiency. So for example, if you have like a robot that takes a very long time to perform an action, it can be better to actually train um, if you're using like some replay buffer where you don't need to do all of that processing again, you can just look up those memories from your experience replay buffer. And similarly, if you find like the CPU Atari simulation, the performance bottleneck is actually in the environment, then you can um, maximize your GPU occupancy a lot better if you just store those experiences in a replay buffer. You can also do prioritize replay. And again, as we mentioned in the previous lecture where this is just where your experiences are rated or prioritized according to um, according to some heuristic and then you can use sample based on those probabilities so you can use like numpy at, numpy at random choice to specify the probabilities from which you sample your replay buffer to learn from the proximal policy is carefully is like a very carefully designed regularizer uh, that can be added to vanilla actor critique methods and it it can be implemented efficiently and it strikes like a good balance between sample efficiency and simplicity and then rainbow down here is really like lots and lots of these techniques and it's this huge benchmark. So it tries to find out what combinations of all of these extensions and tricks work really well in particular for Atari. So it's basically they've they've created this larger algorithm with lots and lots of combinations of them and worked out which combinations work well. That's quite a useful paper to read. All right, so that kind of concludes this lecture. So in summary, we've seen that policy gradients they open up many, many new extensions, and the foundations that are being taught today uh, lead into many, many new papers around these variants, where you've got this actor and this critique working together. But there are lots and lots of extensions available, to, and they many have this bias variance trade-off problem. So try to choose the extensions that reduce the variance to which helps stabilize the training overall, because a lot of the time you get like lots and lots of noise in your optimization, as you've probably seen already in the sample code, where you get like one good play from randomly exploring and then most of the time on average uh, you just get zeros everywhere so you get high variance so try to focus on extensions which reduce that variance and that that makes it easier to actually train these models um, consider regularization to encourage exploration as well try and do things smoothly where possible and use large replay buffers and so on and think about prioritizing them Going off policy gives better exploration. So um, if, if we're just learning on the job all the time, if you remember when we talked about that, there was a few issues with that, you know, like that welder analogy where you're just thrown into this workshop and asked to weld and there's lots of things that can go wrong there. It's much better if we have this, if we're able to follow a different policy to the one we're, we're currently um, considering. And it's possible for the actor in the critique to share some of the parameters, so you can actually share weights between them, but again, you have to be careful in how you do that, and it can lead to kind of various issues in stability if you um, don't take a scientific approach to doing it carefully and think to yourself, well, what is, what's gonna happen if I start sharing these, sharing these layers and sharing these weights? <laughs> so for example, if you've got an actor in a critique and they're taking some observations of the states, then the initial parts of the observations might be sensible to have some similarity, like the visual system of the human brain, it's fundamentally a visual system. So if you've got two, two humans, the way their eyes work might be similar, but then you want to diverge and have different behaviors for the actor and the critique in, in choosing the actions and judging the, the value. And then finally, experience replay can increase the sample efficiency uh, in cases where simulation is expensive. So in cases where it requires a lot of processing to work out what the environment is, is doing, or if you've got like a, a robot where it takes a long time to actually take a particular step in the environment or it takes a long time to physically move the robot, then it's good to store all past experiences in some uh, memory somewhere and then we'll just use those over and over again, which allows us to take lots of steps from, from the past experiences. Okay, well, that concludes this lecture. Um, that's it. I hope you have a good week.